welcome to the Ready for Reading podcast. My name is Penny and I am your advocate for story time and like all things reading for military families. And each episode I get to do something super cool. I get to talk to individuals who share United Through Reading's mission of strengthening military families literacy and emotional bonds and just overall well-being through just the shared power of reading. So let's get started. So you know that we just celebrated uh, National Appreciation Military Appreciation Month, and we're also uh, honoring Mental Health Awareness Month at the exact same time. And those are two things that are super near and dear to my heart, and I know that they're near and dear to both of your hearts too. So what we're going to do today is we're just going to talk about the role of literacy and how it can play into the complexity of the... I'm trying to think of like the best way to put this. I think it's the recovery journey when we're talking about um, issues like PTSD or grief, loss, just in the military world. And so joining us today for this important conversation, I have two very cool individuals. I have an award-winning author and filmmaker, David Barclay Moore. And then I also have a licensed clinical social worker, entrepreneur, and I'll say friend, Ms. Crystal bettenhausen Bobolka. Hello, both of you. Hey there. Good morning, Penny. Good morning, David. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So what we're going to be talking about today, again, is like some of the unique challenges that military personnel and their families face when we're on that journey of recovery. Again, when we're talking about those mental health uh, awareness issues like PTSD and grief and loss and all of those things. Um, And so together, I'm hoping that we can kind of delve into that realm just a little bit and really explore how literacy can, I would say, provide, you know, a bridge, encourage empathy, um, or nurture empathy, actually, and provide like a safe haven uh, for individuals to explore and express those complex emotions. That sounds like a lot. (laughs) it sounds like a lot but I'm hoping that we're going to be okay so um just a little bit of background so David you are our 2023 you were the guest of honor at Storybook Ball right I was yeah it was it was wonderful Uh, on uh, October of um, 2023 this story ball there in the beautiful lovely San Diego and uh had a great time um yeah, just um, the United Through Reading people were so gracious and and, and lovely toward me, and uh, even brought me my favorite cherry pie there, <laughs> 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 which I, I adore. I've loved cherry pie since I was a a youth, and um, yeah, it was just a really great experience meeting the getting able to sit, sit with the Admiral there and meeting the heads of the organizations and the local people in San Diego and from all over, really, all over the world at that, at that ball. It was a tremendous experience. That's so cool. You are a recipient of the Audrey Geisel uh, Friend of Military Children Award. Yes. That's so cool. That's so cool. And Crystal, you were there too. You actually introduced David. I yes, I had the honor of introducing David, and it was it was serendipitous because my ten year old, um, our middle child, was able to join us, and we had been reading some of David's work, and it was just such a surreal moment to be there and and to really have the honor of introducing him. Wow, that's super cool. That's super cool. The only reason why I wasn't there is because I was moving across country. That's literally the only thing that would have kept me from spending the night with both of you two and then having that evening. That was really, really cool. That's cool. Okay. So um, so let's dig in. So David, you are the author of Boyogi, which is one of my new favorite books. I was actually able to read it on the UTR app. And I was like, okay, yoga, healing, I'm here for it. Can you tell us just a little bit about that book? Uh, Yeah, yeah, it is right here. Um, And uh, this is my second picture book. Uh, My first book is called Carry Me Back. Uh, And uh, this is number two. And I have another picture book coming out next year, which I'm very, very excited about. Uh, And I've also written two novels, uh, The Stars Beneath Our Feet, uh, which won a Credit Scott King John Steptoe Award, uh, and um, 
the, the second novel is uh, Howler the Fireflies, which are both middle grade novels. So I kind of, I, I write a lot. I'm a, a writer and a filmmaker, you know, so I kind of, uh, you know, I, I just don't stick to one kind of genre of writing. You know, so I've written, you know, picture books and novels and going to be writing some adult novels and I'm working on the screenplay for the film adaptation of The Stars Beneath Our Feet. Uh, so, you know, and I, you know, always been a storyteller, always been a, uh, someone who likes to kind of tell yarns and listen to yarns. And so uh, integrating kind of the mental health issues into a lot of my books for children has been really important to me. For lots of reasons. Wow. Um, that's, that's awesome. All right, Crystal. So I know that you are an entrepreneur. I know that. And I just, um, I just, I'm hoping you'll tell us just a little bit about how your journey into um, getting into the mental health world and maybe a little bit about through the kaleidoscope wellness, just a little just tell us about how you melded, you know, living in the military community and mental health and how it's become special and intertwined to you. Oh, do we have all day? I feel Yes, like I do. I schedule this all day. I have nothing else after this. I am here for you and David. I'm ready. I have to I have to say Crystal gives great introductions if you ever win an award. So she's the one that's won <laughs> presenting the award. <laughs> Thank you, David. That's that's very kind. I never did that before, so it was I was a first time um, introductor, if that's the right word, introducer. Um, but it, it really was an honor. It was really it was so it was just so fun, and we did miss you so much, Penny. Um, your your absence was missed. Um, Gosh, I feel like my my career has been, um, you know, just as diverse as the duty stations that we've served at, and it all kind of came um to this amazing place that it is because of my spouse's service i don't i don't think it would have just happened had we not um been in japan and um you know served in the middle east and when the pandemic hit my husband was in newport rhode island and i was in hawaii so we couldn't possibly be in different places of the u.s <laughs> and you know, i had three children and i was trying to work full time and keep my patients and their family members calm while trying to be calm myself and, you know, just kind of seeing everything that we knew kind of dissolve. And um, it was, it was just like, okay, we can't do this anymore. And I think it was probably the first time too, that I put my own mental health first as a priority and said, you know, there are 48, 48. I want to tell you there's 48 hours in the day. There are not, there's only 24 and I'm not a superwoman and we really need to be, um, prioritizing sleep and eating and family time and reading to our children. And we can't do that when we're working around the clock. So I had to make some changes. And that's kind of when I came into private practice. And wow. again, never would have thought that I would be doing this. And it's just, it's, it's been amazing. That's super cool. Okay. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, let me ask you both this. So now that I got a, a better feel on your backgrounds and how this this all came to be, how you got to where you are, why do you think it is so important that we promote the discussion of mental health awareness, especially when it comes to military families? Crystal? <laughs> I was Jeez. patiently waiting. I was like, who wants to jump Ooh. in on that? Um. You know, I, there is just such a stigma against mental health, and I think we're getting we're getting to a point where it's it's dying down a little bit. Um, I think the pandemic definitely helped, right? Um, gosh, everybody had anxiety, and oh, look, now we can tap in from our homes and make therapy um, and support groups, and you know, gaining support for our mental health so much more accessible. Um, you know, we're constantly going through changes in, in the military. We're constantly grieving. Um, I say we're, we're experts at loss as military family members and military service members. You know, we jump into a new job, jump into a new community, and then um, we have no choice in when we really say goodbye to that community, right? And it, it becomes so normalized. And in all of that, we're still human beings 
you know, dealing with all this, the stressors from, you know, finances and the economy to political climate and, um, you know, just functioning as human beings. And that can be really stressful. So I think being able to, um, to promote discussions normalizes it. It um, helps eradicate that stigma. Um, you know, I always always use the example with my own clients and, and friends and family members, you know, we would talk so openly about a heart condition, right? And that heart condition, there usually won't be any blame or shame with it, right? Mm -hmm. if it's immediately right, validated. Right? Yeah. Right. It's like, oh my gosh, how can I help? Um, and I think, you know, we, we have completely different ideas and thoughts on when somebody says, I was just diagnosed with anxiety, right? Um, you know, I think there's going to be um, some different conversations and I think there's a lot of shame and um, and people are scared to share and therefore the conversations don't take place. So, you know, we're struggling behind closed doors and that only it only leads to more issues with isolation. And I would say, you know, isolation and shame really like to go to a party together and exception is... <laughs> Right. So they, they don't like to go by themselves. So, you know, if you're isolating because you don't feel validated, because you don't feel comfortable talking about your mental health, um, your best buddy shame is going to join you in that. And and that's only going to further perpetuate the issue. And and then we we go into perceptions and perception is the cool kid that's always throwing the parties that shame and isolation go with, you know, go to. Um, so when we add those three together, I think that's when it, it gets really dangerous. Um, you know, I think it's just we, we have to be talking about these challenges. We have to be talking about the conditions. We need to validate it because honestly, that's how we save lives. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Agreed. Agreed. And David, yeah, so, I, I, oh, go ahead, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think the stigma, uh, I totally agree with that as far as being, um, you know, a major issue and um, kind of a deterrent for a lot of people for seeking out kind of mental health help. Um, I think it saves lives. Um, seeking out mental health and, and getting um, help with mental health, rather. Um, particularly, I think, for um, military families. Uh, I'm not military, but all of my uncles on my um, mother's side of the family were in the military, and my father. Well, that makes uh, you military. That makes Does you a grown-up okay, military well, It makes you a grown-up military kid. <laughs> Yes, and it does. My, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess. Uh, and then also my um, my nephew is currently actually, he, just, he graduated from the Annapolis uh, last year. Oh, so. wow, congratulations. But, uh, congratulations. Yeah, it's great, great, yeah. But um, I think particularly with military families, I think uh, like Crystal was kind of talking about, I think relationships is kind of key. Uh, I mean, there are lots of different aspects of kind of a, attending to your mental health, but I think particularly with, within a family structure, um, just that the whole, particularly within military families, the whole, whole idea of separation and uh, anxiety around that, um, you know, trauma associated with that, with that, particularly with the, when it comes to children, you know, being separated, um, uh, kind of not knowing uh, a lot of uh, not having complete control over your, your lives, you know, um, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of that can cause a lot of problems, uh, and challenges for families in particular. And so I think with, uh, one of the things that either reading up on kind of mental health or seeking out professionals, or even like in my, uh, the picture book Boyogi, the, uh, it's a military father who returns home from overseas troubled uh and him and his young son uh start taking yoga classes together you know and, it, and the father is also it mentions in the book that the father is also in therapy but the yoga classes actually kind of help with that you know so but um just you know 
taking care, you know, to, to be kind of, um, to focus on that and to think of it not as much as something that is stigmatizing, but almost like with people who have personal trainers at the gym, you know, like a therapist could be <laughs> almost considered a, a personal trainer for your mind, you know. Uh, oh, I like not, that. Well, you know, not putting ideas into your head or trying to lead you a certain way, but just trying to help you see things clearly and kind of, you know, improve yourself. You know, I think that's a, a very healthy way to look at, at therapy, you know, and there's, there's all types of things like meditation and because uh, of yoga and all different other types of wellness practices that uh, can help with that, you know. Um, Okay. Well, you know, I'm glad that um, you brought Boyogi back up because one of my favorite things about your book, and Crystal, you touched on this too, about those invisible wounds, invisible wounds. And so one of my favorite things is uh, when the, the mother character is explaining to this, well, explaining to the son, dad is sick. Well, you know, is he hurt? Like He's hurt, right? He's hurt. But how is he hurt? Um, so I just like how you explain that in the book. Can you give us just a little bit of that? Can you touch on it? Just how they're explaining how the father is, you know, not necessarily, I don't want, I don't want to say sick because I don't think of mental health awareness as being sick, but how he is in need of some assistance that might not be for a visible wound. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, no, it's, thank you for that. Thank you for, you know, saying that. Um, and uh, I think this is it here, actually. I just happened to open up to it. And, uh, you know, it's for a picture book. Like I said, I write in all different types of like novels and different things. And, but for a picture book for, for young children, you know, most of the time they're read to them, most of the time. Um, and you also, you know, everything that I write, I try to communicate complex ideas, regardless of it's for teens. Like I'm working on something right now, which is going to be uh, actually two things that are gonna be directed at for teenagers older. Uh, and I've written for middle grade and then for the very youngest of our children. And so I just, I wanted to try to communicate um, complex ideas, but in a way that is um, accessible for the youngest children, you know. And so, um, like for example, we talk about mental wellness in our minds and our imaginations and creativity. And then that page that you were talking about here, um, it's the mother and her little son in the kitchen talking about the, you know, the father. And uh, I'll just read this part here. It says, mama Please asked do. me, oh, thanks. Uh, do you know what your mind is? I shook my head. This is the little boy saying, it's in the little boy's voice. I shook my head. She touched my forehead. Your mind is in here. It's the things you think about. It's how you feel happy or sad. It's the, it's the songs you like to sing and your favorite colors. Our minds are very precious and we need to take care of them. Your mind is what makes you, you. Daddy's is what, is what makes daddy, daddy. I thought I understood then. So it's just, you know, trying to open up that whole world of, of what your mind is, creativity, what makes you you in a way that the kids can kind of understand it, you know. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure and also an honor for, for me to be able to do what I do. Um, yeah, I mean, there's any way that I can kind of help in that situation, you know, from the parental side or the children's side, you know, I could serve that benefit. I mean, one of the things I've, I've said before is that uh, a couple of years ago, when I was writing this picture book, uh, and we had found an illustrator, it's uh, published by Candlewick Press. And um, I was at a conference somewhere, and a uh, literary conference, and I went down to the hotel you know, the bar, and uh, was just kind of sitting there in between sessions. 
and uh, there was this uh, a Marine and his uh, girlfriend were sitting at the bar. So we, we were sitting by, 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 by each other and we started chatting and stuff. I told him I was a writer. And I just happened to have an image from one of the, one of the images from Boyogi on my cell phone that my publisher had sent me just to see if I liked it or not. And it was uh, the very first image of the book, which is, um, I'll show it here, which is this image here. I can see that. And it's, I think that's an image that so many of us are uh, familiar with uh, in this country, unfortunately. But it's uh, the father kind of returning home after having been away for such a long time and embracing his son. And the way that they, in my, how I see it is this, it's like the father's embracing his child as if he never wants to let go again. He never wants yeah. to leave his son, you know. And I showed that image to the Marine, you know, at the hotel uh, and he started to tear up, you know, he's this big tough Marine and everything. And he uh, got very emotional and, you know, his eyes got wet because he had children and he had gone through that, you know, and he had, um, was, um, you know, kind of dealing with that as, as we spoke really. Uh, so I actually, we exchanged emails and I, um, sent him, you know, when the book was out and everything and he responded. So, uh, you know, I think, I think he has two daughters. So, um, I think that, um, you know, it's, people like to be, seen and they like to have their stories told because it always doesn't happen not even when stories are told or listened to and so it's important i think Interesting. so how did let me think about how to ask this so the complex of the expressing expressing the complexity of emotions how did you decide that you wanted to do that through the lens through the eyes of a military family well i mean there was um so much going on at the time, you know, uh, particularly in Af Afghanistan. I and mean, when I was writing this was when we were in the process of kind of uh, pulling out of, of, of Afghanistan. Um, and, uh, you know, so a lot of it was just very present in the news and around me, you know, and it just, you know, and of course I you know, have family that are in the military and have, have gone through similar things. And so uh, I just, I, I saw it personally as something that was kind of needed and would probably be helpful for a lot of uh, families and mil military families particularly. Uh, I think not just military families can benefit from the book, you know, oh, it's, yes. um, yeah. you know, it's, it's broadly, I mean, it's looking at a very specific family and their issues, right? But all, all of us on some level or on one way or another deal with that you know, um, that, uh, in one way or another, you know, uh, it's, it's universal, I think. Agreed. Yeah. It just really resonated with us because, you know, um, we could see our, every, uh, everyone I know who, who has read through that book can see themselves in it. So I just thought it was just, I was just curious, um, how you got to that lens. So that's just pretty neat. And I would say like for you, Crystal, so have have you used books like this or uh, just any kind of book like this, right? Um, to help you kind of get through um, or to pick like a difficult period in your life or your children's lives. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so many books. And I, I think when I'll go back to what David just shared earlier, you know, my spouse did a GSA in Afghanistan when our eldest was, Gosh, she was going into second grade. And I remember looking for books and not finding a lot. Um, so when I read David's book, I was like, where was this book been for the last, you know, 15 years? Because it really would have been handy. And I think, you know, it's it's timeless because we're gonna need it. Um, so I was just so thankful um to have found it and then found that it was, you know, integrating some different practices like yoga and just discussing, gosh, you know what your mind is like little things like that. It just, um, it's been so great. And, and both of my younger kids, um, appreciate it. Cause at the time, you know, we, we had our favorites like kissing hand and thinking about uh, night catcher, 
the invisible string, you know, these oh, yeah. ones, you know, but, and they're great, but they're so universal. And I think what my kids and what I've loved is when there's a little bit of that military um, influence on it, right? Because we can say, oh my gosh, that's like us, right? We can identify um, and we can feel validated and we can feel seen. You know, so many military families don't feel seen. Um, you know, we are just really it's a tiny little percentage of the population. Um, so, um, you know, I think just, again, books just give us that moment to pause. And, and when, you know, anyone is challenged with mental health issues like, um, you know, depression, anxiety, PTSD, you know, doing the little things is so hard, right? It's not like walking into a room and turning on a light switch and saying, oh, I feel better, right? right. Um, you know, it's little tiny micro movements and being able to prioritize sitting down and reading a book is pretty monumental in the realm of self-care. And it's not that easy, right? when we can do that, that's when we can put a pause on all those other anxious thoughts. We could escape for a little bit. We can find some validation. Um, and it changes the brain like Netflix never will be able to, right? Oh, um, yeah. So, you know, I think being able to, to prioritize reading and books and, you know, I, I know we have, you know, technology advances with um, being able to read books on devices, but I'm like, no, paper books just need to live on forever, right? Because we need to feel, we need to have all of our senses engaged. Even the sound of turning a page. I was, you know, just even David, when he was showing me the book, I'm like, see, there's a little sound there. And, and that's <laughs> sensory that we need to be able to engage and be mindful of where we're at. So it's just so much more than just a book. Agreed. And being a part of an organization that gives out, you know, tens of thousands of books. It's more than just a book. It's the feel of a brand new book. It's the pages. It's the smell. It's the binding of it. Like it's, it's, every, it's epic. It's everything. It's just, okay. I'll go off on a whole, a whole thing on that. <laughs> okay. So, you know, they say like books, you know, they, the act is like mirrors, right? Act is mirrors and windows. And I really want to know what that phrase means to both of you. Um, well, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I forget uh, who kind of coined that phrase, but I think it was an educator several years ago about mirrors and windows, um, uh, particularly when it comes to, to books. Uh, and that term mirrors and windows, um, but for those who don't know, it's just basically uh, when it comes to books, a mirror is like if you pick up a book and you see yourself in it, like with crystals so eloquently just talking about. And uh, a window is uh, when you pick up a book, uh, it, it takes you to some place that you've never been before, some place you're not familiar with. So it's a new experience, right? And for what I do, particularly with children's literature, primarily with children's literature, uh, that those notions of mirrors and windows are so important. Uh, you know, most of my work tends to, as a now tends to focus on uh, black cultures and how they, those cultures intersect with other global cultures. That's kind of like my focus, artist uh, uh, focus. And it's, so it's very important, I think, for African-American children to see themselves and to get affirmed by that. Because um, I didn't have as much of that when I was a child growing up. You know? um, yeah. So, you know, books as mirrors, seeing yourself in a book, seeing your life in a book reflected is so important. I mean, it just, it, I think it helps you become a, a, a much more kind of um, just more confident individual, you know? Uh, you can see yourself doing things, see yourself in other places that you wouldn't have thought about before, you know? Uh, you can learn new ways of dealing with issues that you hadn't thought of before. Um, that's one of the things with my novel, The Stars Beneath Our Feet. There's a, a boy in there who's faced with some boys and, and girls who are faced with some really tough decisions in Harlem. And so a lot of that is like giving kids that space. Like, okay, well, I live in that neighborhood that's down the block from me. And that boy 
did the same thing to me yesterday. You know, how, how am I going to deal with that action? How, how will I respond? Will I respond in a way that will uh, negatively affect me for the rest of my life or in a way that is um, creative and, you know, helps in, improve my life? Makes, you know, uh, uh, it's so important, I think, for particularly books as, um, as windows so that we can see each other, we can look out the window and we can, you know, understand what the other person is going through walking in their shoes, so to speak, you know, so, uh, you know, I think it's terribly important, you know, I'm not the first person to say that, you know, but uh, a lot of my work focuses around those two notions of mirrors and windows. Yeah. And that's really cool. I mean, that makes total sense to us because we see it a lot in the military. We get exposed to like different cultures and customs and people from all over the world. And for me, and and I would say the 99.9% of people I meet, uh, it's the most exciting thing ever. Um, because I love the idea of, well, I, I love food and I do love books too, but they're they're equal and love together. Um, but that's one of my, when I think about being introduced to different cultures, it's being able to maybe live in different installations and taste different kinds of food that I never would have experienced before. And yeah, it might translate to me buying a cookbook. So then I put my two loves, <laughs> my two loves together. Um, but it's also one of the reasons why we like to have a huge curated list of books that look and sound as diverse as our military is. So I love, um, yeah, we, that's one of our, our favorite things, book shopping for sure. So I think that yeah, that's, uh, the, that's the very travel, cool. Travel is so important for children. You know, I, I, I um, both of my parents have passed away, but uh, I cherish them and for lots of reasons. But one of the things is that when we were growing up, you know, I had three siblings and, and my two folks and uh, our, our parents took us everywhere with them. You know, and but growing up that way as a child, being on the road, the same way like what you're talking about, you know, as far as seeing different cultures and things, it was invaluable, you know. Yeah. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why I'm a storyteller to this day because it, it just influences a child's creativity the more they travel. And a book can take you anywhere. So yeah, I'm, I love that. Okay, I love that. So you know, speaking of like a book can take you anywhere, can teach you anything. I mean, how can we, how can books help teach resilience, especially in children? So, um, you know, and I think going into that resiliency factor goes right back into windows and mirrors and doors, right? Um, I think resiliency I mean, that's resiliency is a really triggering word for me <laughs> because I think sometimes, you know, a lot of pressure is put on military yeah. families to be resilient. And yeah. I think um, in my own research and my doctoral program, every service branch has a different definition of what resilience is, which is really, really interesting to look at. Um, so I'm going to focus more on the coping skill side of it because okay. um, you know, I think I... it's coping skills. And if we can start teaching coping skills from a very, very early age, right, teaching that um, that diversity exists, um, then, um, you know, I think what I loved and I said in my introduction um, at the storybook ball about David was how important it is for kids to be able to see that reflection in books and then be able to see that there's challenges we have to normalize these challenges. We have to, you know, in our family, we, we celebrate failure because we don't learn when we're perfect and there is no perfect. So then no learning takes place. Right. Um, so being able to really um, build those coping skills early on and, and they come from mistakes, you know, they come from trials and they come from, um, you know, challenges. So I think books are able um, to set that stage Um our family did not have, um, you know, major injuries of my spouse's time in Afghanistan, but being able to, to teach through a book like David's book that, you know, there are invisible wounds and then there are very visible wounds. And, you know, for that to be normalized, because we never know when we're going to be 
at an airport when an honors flight comes back and we're seeing some veterans that might be missing some limbs, right? Um, it, it teaches us not only to have those coping skills, but to have that compassion for diversity and people that, um, you know, that have done so much to, to keep us safe, really. I'm, I'm blessed, you know, didn't have to deal with trauma, uh, traumatic childhood or anything like that. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, this experiences like that also teaching in other places in New York City and Harlem uh, is, is what kind of inspired me to write some of the middle grade novels that I've, that I've written because I, you know, I've seen kids um, learn from those books. Uh, you know, not necessarily my, well, you know, since then, I guess my books, but back then it was like, you know, Jackie Woodson, Walter Mosley, J Jason Reynolds, those are amazing authors that speak to those groups. And the kids see their lives in there, they see the different challenges, and they're able to identify and sometimes make adjustments, you know. Uh, and that's one of the things, you know, that reading across the board, I think, teaches resiliency in children through that method of what I was kind of talking about earlier, where you see yourselves, you see your stories, and you learn how to kind of deal with things. And so it's very helpful. And one of the great things I think about United Through Reading is the, the just facilitating reading, uh, you know, to between parents and children, uh, which goes back to the whole thing of relationships and connections, right? Because that's an issue that I think a lot of military families struggle with is maintaining healthy relationships, healthy connections over vast, you know, uh, territories or even just um, emotional vastness of stress that can, that can cause problems, you know. And so uh, one of the great things about you know, United Through Reading, what, they, what you guys do is that making it easier for uh, families to reinforce those bonds, develop those bonds, through the reading thing, because it's it's one of the best ways, I think, to teach uh, children resilience is through healthy relationships and maintaining connections with their parents. That's, I think that's one of the, the number one things, you know. And so reading is a type of resiliency. I think you just summed that up beautifully. If I could package that and just ex explain United Through Reading just like that to every person I ever met, then I would never have enough books to share because everybody would want to be a part of the program for sure. Yes, that one's reading builds resiliency. It really does. That's awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, Crystal, give me your 20 second pitch on why reading and resiliency are so great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, it goes obviously just, you know, the fundamentals of, of what reading does to our brain, right? I mean, it's learning, um, you know, and how, um, just how impactful reading can be just in general, educationally. But I think from that kind of psychosocial perspective that it, it just really allows us to, to escape and have a a window open to the world, right? Places that we can't travel. Um, military families are blessed oftentimes to travel all over the world. Most people don't have that op opportunity and books bring that and they, um, you know, show that there can be challenging situations. Um, what UTR did so well with pivoting onto the app was, you know, allowing not only that service member to be recording, right, but for other family members, because again, you know, the, the traditional mom and dad families, that's not, you know, that's not the norm always, right? So there's right. so many different diverse caregivers and family members and, you know, long distance parenting. And, you know, again, our situation of, you know, not necessarily having a deployment, but a geographical separation, right? And so yeah. much, um, so much bonding and resiliency can be built, you know, just by sitting and watching dad or mom or grandpa or grandma read, read a book, you know, it's, it's bonding. And that is, part of our hierarchy of needs, right? We, we need to have that emotional bonding and that's, that's building that resiliency and those coping skills. Excellent. Excellent. It was, I love that. Okay. So, well, David and Crystal, we could do this. I, well, I could do this with you both all day. 
we can talk about reading and how important it is to our mental health and our resiliency and our connections and bonding. In fact, I, I have all day to do it if you want to, but I'm sure you both have to go. <laughs> uh, and so I just want to say um, thank you. Thank you so much for giving me a little bit of your time and sharing some of your expertise with us. Thank you. And of course, for our military affiliated families who are listening, definitely go and check out Boy Yogi. It is uh, in the ebook form on our app. That was actually the first place that I read it. And I thought that I was like, oh my gosh, okay. Because, you know, I, I love my Kindles, but I love my regular books too. Don't get me wrong. And I do have my signed copy of the regular book. Don't worry. <laughs> but, you know, definitely go to, you can go to our app right now and go read it and check it out. And then, of course, um, if you're struggling with some grief and anxiety and depression, if I would definitely reach out to through the kaleidoscope of wellness and see if you see if you, Crystal, are operating in their area for telehealth. So I'll just put that out there if that's okay. Okay. <laughs> that's fine. That is, I always, I always want to give a plug, you know, um, for military one sources being kind of that one-stop shop for so many resources, um, but also that non-clinical support for uh, military families and um, dependents and even active duty to be able to utilize those employment assistant programs. That is military one source. It's free, it's pretty easy. And I am a provider in um, Hawaii, North Dakota, and California. So, and there's so many amazing skilled clinicians that can that can support any kind of changes that military families are going through. So thank you, Penny. You're welcome. And it's for the lifespan, life, right? For the lifespan. And David, you, yeah. And David, yours is for the lifespan of reading and just social awareness as well. So I love it both. So, uh, so thank you both. Um, also, I'll always tell everybody, don't be afraid to go to Unite Through Reading and check out our resources. Um, we've got the great curated list of books that's super reflective of our military community. We've got some literacy guides. I mean, just please come and hang out with us. We are, we are definitely here to help and help your military family stay connected. And um, I would like to say, if people want to stay up to date on what I'm up to, um, I'm D Barclay Moore on all the social medias. So just D then Barclay Moore. Um, I'm editing right now. I'm editing a, an anthology on mental health for boys and teenagers. So it should be out wow. in a couple of years. Penguin Random House. So uh, you can stay up to date. On what's going on? And I want to, you know, thank uh, once again. Thank you, Crystal. <laughs> it's great being in the same space with you, same virtual space, I guess, with you. And Penny, thank you uh, for putting this together and being such a, a great host. And also United to Read, everyone there. Gracias. Well, thank you.